She's the head honcho herself, she's the hostess with the mostess, she's going to assimilate you, your entire family and your world. Make sure you read the original article by the wonderful Jack Kiley, I am Sean Ferrick, and here is 11 things you didn't know about the Borg Queen. Number 11. Enigmatic Entity it's difficult to fathom now, but the introduction of the Borg Queen in Star Trek First Contact wasn't well received by all at the time of the film's release. Controversy among Star Trek fans? Well, I never. Before First Contact, the Borg were a homogenous single-willed foe with no clear leader, or rather, without the apparent need for one. This kind of impenetrable, indivisible hive mind, say for Locutus, was, for some, their distinctive appeal. The fact that the Borg Queen had never been mentioned in The Next Generation made the character equally perplexing for some fans. As First Contact co-writer Branham Braga discussed in an interview with Star Trek.com, it was quickly realised that a robot zombie, tight-lipped adversary wouldn't quite work for a feature film. This is why the Queen was created to speak for the Borg, and not just because they were gunning for sexiest on-screen kiss. Fans were also left unclear by the film as to the exact role the Queen played within the Collective. You could think of the Queen as some sort of central processing and command hub from within the central nexus. As First Contact screenwriter Ron Moore also stated, the Borg Queen was always intended to be a literal person and not merely a manifestation of the Collective. Number 10. Maybe she's Borg with it. Maybe it's make-believe. For their appearance in Star Trek First Contact, the Borg got a significant wardrobe and makeup upgrade overseen by the incomparable Michael Westmore. Individually moulded bodysuits and Borg implants were created, and airbrushing was used for the creepier, more intricately technological look on the skin of each drone. In the end, the whole process of Borgification took around five hours for each actor. Electronic makeup artist Michael Westmore Jr., son of above, also got creative and made the light on each one of the new Borg eyepieces blink the names of members of the cast and crew in Morse code. The transformation was the most extensive for Alice Krieg. It took on average six and a half hours for the actress to get into the Borg Queen makeup and suit. The first bodysuit that was used caused her blisters, and the silver contact lenses that formed part of the look were so painful, Krieg could only wear them for a maximum of four minutes at a time. The floating head sequence in First Contact was done mostly through practical effects. To achieve the scene, Krieg was separated into two, a prosthetic Borg neck with an animatronic spine fixed to her neck at an angle, and the rest of her body wrapped in blue, placed on a slant board attached to a crane rig to lower the actress down to the set. Just to be clear, the Borg Queen was separated in two. Alice Krieg was not bifurcated for this film. Number 9. The Royal We. As the Queen herself put it, I am the beginning the end, the one who is many. Far from being a contradiction in terms, the Borg Queen is instead probably the ultimate example of the majestic plural. We have seen multiple different versions and copies of the Borg Queen over the years, leading to a lot of speculation as to just how this system of replacements works, still largely unexplained in canon. The Queen was by Picard Lacutus' side on the cube headed to Sector 001 in the best of both worlds. Wolf 359 was an inside job, and yet despite that cube's destruction, was very much alive and assimilating during the events of First Contact. Having dissolved in plasma coolant at the end of that movie, the Borg Queen nonetheless made a second appearance in the Star Trek Voyager feature-length episode Dark Frontier. Alice Krieg was unavailable to reprise the role for the episode, and so Susanna Thompson, who had auditioned to play the Queen in First Contact, was hired. Whilst this Voyager version was meant to be in the same line as Krieg's incarnation, Thompson's Queen was also intended to be somewhat distinct. Thompson wore the same bodysuit as Alice Krieg, with only a few alterations made to fit, and the Queen's makeup got a bit of a retouch. Thompson will play the Queen once more in the Voyager 2 parter Unimatrix Zero, and Krieg returned in the season finale Endgame. In season 2 of Star Trek Picard, we would meet a different, but equally familiar, Borg Queen, portrayed by the sadly missed Annie Wershing. And the character was then given a surprising twist by Alison Pill. Technically speaking, Seven of Nine was also the Borg Queen of her own mini collective on the Artifact Cube for a hot minute. For her appearances in the final season of Star Trek Picard, the Borg Queen was played by two people. Reprising the role, Alice Creek gave her immediately recognisable voice to the Queen, and it was Australian actress Jane Edwina Seymour who stood in on set with a tour de force and bloody scary performance as her body double. Number 8. A Dating Profile The origins of the Borg Queen remain one of the most mysterious parts of Star Trek. We know very little about how this embodiment, perhaps mastermind of the Collective, came to be, or even much about her daily existence. Do multiple queens exist simultaneously? Similar to the bee, does any drone have the potential to become queen? 
From canon, we know that the Borg originated in the Delta Quadrant thousands of centuries ago, much like any other humanoid species. At an unknown point in their history, they began to incorporate cybernetic technology into their bodies. As the Vadwar revealed in Star Trek Voyager's episode Dragon's Teeth, the Borg had only assimilated a handful of systems by what was the 15th century on Earth. It's never indicated if the Borg Queen was around practicing her high wire act in the 1400s. The collective itself may not have known, as their memory of that time was fragmentary. Only the few bits of dating we do get for the, or a, Queen comes from two Voyager episodes. In Dark Frontier, the Queen states to Seven that we all originated from lesser species. I myself came from species 125. Later, in Unimatrix Zero Part 2, the Queen intimates that when she was assimilated, she was just about the age of the child she speaks to during her visit to the Borg virtual reality. While this would at least tend to mean that the Queen became Borg at some point rather than being created in situ, it would be difficult to date her assimilation, especially given the fact that the Borg use maturation chambers which may accelerate growth. Number 7. Tales Worthy of Assimilation the seductive appeal of the Federation's greatest foe has been hard to resist for creators of Star Trek beta canon. What seems to entice writers the most is origin stories for the Borg and their monarch, and given that the series and films have provided us with very little on how the Borg, let alone the Queen, came to be, they have had a lot of creative space for invention. The very nature of the species tends to lend itself to origin stories along the themes of technology run amok or experiment gone awry. For example, both the Star Trek the original series manga story Side Effects from the Shinsei Shinsei anthology and the Strange New World 6 short story The Beginning depict the creation of the first Borg Queen as the result of ill-fated medical experiments attempting to cure a deadly disease. In the Star Trek Destiny trilogy by David Mack, the predecessor to the Borg Queen was the disastrous result of a last-ditch attempt for survival by a member of the highly advanced alien race the Celiar, capable of forming their own hive-like mind called the Gestalt, and a group of humans from the Columbia NX-02 stranded in the past. Some of the novels do expand upon the role of the Queen within the Collective. In the Star Trek Voyager book, The Farther Shore by Christy Golden, the Borg have a royal protocol to quickly replace a Queen, whereas in the Destiny series, several Queens can exist at the same time. In the game, Star Trek Legacy, a Queen was needed to unite the Borg, who were originally created by V'ger. In Star Trek Online, the Borg and their Queen returned in 2409 to launch an assault on the Alpha and Beta Quadrants. In the perfectly titled The Next Generation Mirror Universe novel The Worst of Both Worlds by Greg Cox, there's also a Borg King. Number 6. Don't be so three-dimensional. Equally outside of what is considered canon, what you might not know is that the Borg Queen was central to the story of the Star Trek The Experience Borg Invasion 4D attraction in Las Vegas. The immersive experience, which included a number of live performers, was set aboard a Starfleet research outpost. Guests on the ride were told, by the Doctor no less, that they were there as part of medical research into their possible genetic immunity to Borg assimilation. Naturally, a Borg cube arrives to put a stop to all that, with none other than the Borg Queen aboard. 4D effects mounted in interactive chairs were used to make the audience feel like they were being infected by nanoprobes as the Queen appeared. Admiral Janeway arrives aboard Voyager and, with a little help from the Doctor, saves the day. Alice Krieg, who had played the character only about a year earlier in Endgame, was the Borg Queen. As we find out in the Voyager Season 7 DVD extra, The Making of Borg Invasion 4D, all of the original Borg who worked on First Contact were hired for the filming, making it something of a family reunion for Krieg. Number 5. Mind your beeswax. For the new Borg Queen of a beehive to hatch from her cell, she must first chew through a wax cap in which the worker bees have encased her. The wonders of nature. Yeah, planet Earth this ain't. For her mechanical majesty in Star Trek, Queen Cells also exist aboard Borg vessels, although they seem to function as a place of temporary residence, or hiding, a locus of control, and somewhere to flee from. The Queen Cell contained a powerful piece of technology called a spatial trajector, assimilated from the Delta Quadrant species, the Sicarians, capable of transporting the Queen up to 40,000 light years, but only in the event of an emergency. Each appearance of the Queen, aside from Star Trek Voyager's Endgame, has been in disembodied form. 
In Voyager, within Unimatrix 1, the Queen descended from a central alcove as little more than a head and shoulders, only for the knees and toes to join her from compartments beneath the floor. She's introduced in first contact in disassembled mode, and Annie Wershing's Queen in Picard is similarly disincorporated, although with arms and more of a torso this time. It is likely that the Borg Queen spent most of her time disassembled in the central alcove, only going walkabouts when the need arose. By the time we see the Queen in Season 3 of Picard, however, she could only dream of such flawless heights. Number 4. The Janeway Factor Captain Janeway and the crew of Voyager had bounties of battles with the Borg Queen and yet for the most part avoided the nanoprobe treatment. As they hitched a transwarp ride back to the Alpha Quadrant, they even managed to decimate the Borg and destroy the, or at least one, Queen with just one hyperspray full of a neurolytic pathogen. It was also thanks to Voyager that the research of pioneering exobiologists the Hansons was found. The couple had set off in search of the Borg. During their three years in the field, before their eventual assimilation, the Hansons became aware of the existence of the Borg Queen and of her primary residence, Unimatrix 1. Such knowledge was well in advance of the Federation, who, we assume, only found out about the Borg Queen after the Enterprise E returned to 2373. Until recently, since her presumed death in Endgame, we hadn't seen another prime version of the Borg Queen, aside from the hilariously holographic hindrance to Boimler's perfection in Lower Decks episode I Excretus. Well, that was until the last two episodes of the Star Trek Picard Season 3 and prior as a voice inside Jack Crusher's head. Number 3. Resistance is Retro Star Trek Picard introduced us to a very different Borg Queen from the beginning of its second season. Looking more like she's about to work the runway and read you for filth than rumble your resistance, this Queen, who had fused with Dr. Agnes Gerati, was looking for peaceful cooperation with the Federation to prevent destruction of galactic proportions. This wasn't the first time we'd seen a different sort of Borg in Trek history, however. In the Star Trek Voyager Season 3 episode Unity, Chakotay, and may as well have been a red shirt and an Kaplan, come across a group of ex-Borg who, by the end of the episode, have formed a new kind of hive mind amongst themselves called the Cooperative, so they can get along with their rowdy neighbours. Unity was also the first episode to show that the Borg as a whole had survived the destruction of their Queen in First Contact, which wasn't a given at the time. As reported in Star Trek Monthly, Issue 24, there was debate as to whether the Borg should return at all after First contact, with the film's co-writer Ronald D. Moore believing the death of the Queen and the other drones should have marked the end for the entire collective. And then along came Terry Metalis. At the climax of Season 3 of Star Trek Picard, we meet the Borg and their Queen, very much post-Endgame, still crippled from the Janeway's neurolytic pathogen. In a similar manner to Annie Wershing's Season 2 version, this Queen is tethered in dismembered form, reduced to draining the life out of the few remaining drones to survive, even consuming their necrotic tissue in this horror show that sends chills down the spine. This place is a tomb, Riker notes ominously. With the help of the Changelings, who also shared the anger of a generation lost to Starfleet, the Queen created a new collective by assimilating the children of Starfleet through their genes. With the Queen's progeny Vox at the helm of the Hive, these Gen Z Borg are no longer just about assimilation, but annihilation. Number 2. If we could turn back time. One fact about the Borg Queen's original outing is so strange you almost won't believe it. Okay, I'll stop. As revealed in 2016, when discussions were being had about who should play the Borg Sovereign, a certain Oscar-winning global pop star's name was in the mix. Had she got the part, perhaps instead of being lowered from the ceiling, Cher's Borg Queen could have entered slowly down an engineering ladder singing Fernando. However, we'd have to agree that First Contact was right in following makeup artist Scott Wheeler's advice when he said in the Hollywood Reporter interview that character would not have worked without Alice Creek. No offence to Cher, she's had some great moments, but it would have been so gimmicky. In another bit of if I could turn back timey-wimey, had Star Trek Enterprise not been cancelled after its fourth season, we might well have finally gotten an origin story for the Borg Queen that would have equally featured Alice Krieg in the role once more. Krieg would have played a Starfleet medical technician who would somehow have met the drones from Enterprise's episode Regeneration, leading to her becoming the Queen. Number 1. Is this the end, my friend? Star Trek Picard, the series, has reached its conclusion, and what an epic ride the final season has been. Not only was it the best of reunions for the next generation cast of characters, sorry Wesley, at least your mum gave you a shout out, it turned out their greatest enemy, the Borg Queen, was hiding behind that big red door inside Jupiter. In the series finale, the Queen is revealed in a mangled, ghoulish state. She does have arms though, so it's not all that, 
Standing beneath her less than majestic majesty is Jack Crusher, looking rather good in his leveled up Locutus getup. Or, as Chris said, he is the Borger King. Do you get it? Do you get it? This queen is desperate, vengeful. She has been working with the rogue changelings all along to weaponize Picard's pre-synth corpse Borgified DNA. Jack, who would probably have preferred to inherit the vineyard, instead receives Picard's genes, altered enough to turn him into a transmitter for a new Borg code. He is the command signal for this new evolution of the Collective and, in some warped way, the Queen believes she's his mother. It is family, both chosen and by birth, that wins the day, however. Picard's love for his son helps break Jack free from the Queen's grasp, and it's the unshakable bond between the crew of the Enterprise D and Riker with his Amzadi that saves the day. The last we see of the Queen is her raising her hand in a futile attempt to shield herself from the fiery blast, screaming out with no one there to hear. The title of the final episode is The Last Generation. This is the end of Star Trek Picard, but could this really be the last we see of the Borg and their Queen? That's everything for our list today. Thank you so much to Jack Kiley for writing this list, and thank you so much to the wonderful editor Martin for making it look so pretty. You're all awesome, everyone. Thank you so much for following along. What do you reckon? Are the Borg done? Or will they regenerate and come back? You let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to get in touch with us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can also get in touch with us on Instagram at Trek Culture YT. I'm at Sean Ferrick on the various socials. Everyone, Slava Ukraina. Look after yourselves, live long and prosper, and have a great time until I see you again. Thanks.